Hello, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Philippa Kelly, resident dramaturg of the California Shakespeare Theatre. And I'm here to deliver for you a holiday lecture. In Shakespeare's time, people would box up their leftover goods and presents and deliver them to others after Christmas Day. We don't have presents and gifts to give you, but we do have this holiday lecture. Well, in 2022, we saw Marcus Gardley's amazing adaptation of King Lear entitled Lear. And so during that year, I had cause to think of Shakespeare's play King Lear even more than I normally do. I'd like us to think for a moment of Shakespeare's plays and of the tools he deployed to make them. It's fascinating to imagine how small was the toolbox of language available at that time to describe the contours of the interior self. Narcissism, self-centred, self-deprecating, unself-confident, hilarious, bumptious, even the word disappointed. None of these emotion-based words was in parlance during Shakespeare's lifetime. A great example of the shift from material to emotional is afforded by the word crazy. This word changed from crazed, as in a vase or vase scarred with cracks, a very physical word, to deranged, demented, of unsound mind, a psychological word in 1610 during Shakespeare's very lifetime. The word had, in other words, been restricted to the material physical sense. And now, with the beckoning of capitalism and attention increasingly being paid to the individual, it was converted to a mental descriptor. Well, given the absence or nascence of emotional vocabulary at the time, though, Shakespeare faced a big challenge in writing his plays. How would he write highly psychological works with a limited lexicon to draw from? Besides inventing some emotional words like hot-blooded or bedazzled, he also found himself drawing on the physical world around him to indicate states of mind. We see these physical features like the forest in As You Like It and Midsummer Night's Dream, the storm and shipwreck in The Tempest and Twelfth Night, the iconic image of identical twins in the Comedy of Errors. All of these physicalities were used to shape and express an emotional landscape. Well, the word landscape is quite apt for this play because Leah moves from court to actual land and with the aid of these physical descriptors, the heath, the storm, the thunder, we undergo with him a terrible emotional journey, his harrowing journey to the mouth of death. In this way, the physical landscape becomes an emotional barometer. The old king cosseted and revered his whole life, having just now divested himself of robes and furs, um, which went together with his majesty, suddenly becomes no one. Is it true that without the titles, robes, furred gowns, without the carriages, or today the armoured limousines with the darkened windows, without the signs that I am important, a human being is nothing, just a frail shell, a vessel emptied of substance? And now we might turn our minds to Lear himself in the play's fourth scene getting his first unpleasant identity jolt as the servant Oswald ignores him, confirming the faint neglect, to quote Lear himself, that's been going on all around the old ex-king.
these days. Bewildered, Leah asked himself, does Leah walk thus, speak thus? Who is it that can tell me who I am? For the first time in his long life, it seems, Leah has been openly disrespectful. For the first time in his long life, he is at odds with himself. His selfhood is shattering. This idea might ring a bell with our own experiences in recent years. So much has happened. Perhaps we lost a family member or our jobs in the pandemic. Perhaps we changed the way we see public gatherings. Who or what is it in a changed world or circumstances that can tell us who we rightly are? When we think of the symbols of a circumstance or position, perhaps a marriage or business clothes, the super fast hairdryer, without them, are we still somebody? Do we deserve to borrow a word from King Lear itself? Do we deserve reverence? Well, we first meet Lear in his full and supreme glory. He may be glorious, but he's also tired. He says that he's preparing to crawl toward death, but it turns out he does not know what that means. And in this play, he learns the hard way. He has believed that he is his majesty. He thinks he's stepping away from his onerous duties, not from himself. And in this play, He learns what majesty is and what crawling toward death actually means. He learns that majesty is not in robes, the coronet, furred gowns. True majesty lies in the self, in self-sovereignty that I will mention in more detail a little bit further on in not letting others' judgments rule how we see ourselves inside. Well, Gloucester, Lear's doppelganger or second self, like Lear, goes on his own terrible journey toward the brink of death. Like Lear, Gloucester is mistaken about his children's language and intentions. Like Lear, He's vainglorious, willfully blind to others' feelings. And like Leah again, he finds himself on a cold and stormy heath. But even more horribly, Gloucester is physically blinded, dependent in the end on his once rejected son Edgar to stand by his side incognito and to lead him forward. Both of them, Leah and Gloucester, and for that matter, Edgar, have been reduced to nothing. And it's in that state that they begin to see the true, unaccommodated substance in other human beings. And Leah asks, seeing Edgar, whom he thinks of as a beggar, is man no more than this? Unaccommodated man is no more but such a poor, poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. And to parallel this, but using a different context, Gloucester says that he doesn't need his eyes because I stumbled when I saw. Over this last weekend, I had the joy of being part of a workshop of Naomi Izuka's play on translation of Richard II at the Magic Theatre in San Francisco, run by the incredible Sean San Jose. I find this play, Richard II, to be such a fascinating precursor to Lear. It's built on the idea of dethroning, 
of using the physical mirror to suggest the character's struggle to connect the outside of the self, that is the self of the past, the self we still may expect at some level to see, with the inside of a self. Richard II, once deposed, uses a mirror to indicate the struggle. The king, now no longer the king, who's given his place to Bolingbroke, he asks for a mirror to be brought so that he can contemplate his face and try to understand that while he still has that same face, he no longer has the same identity. The mirror embodies this paradox. He shows the same face, the face that used to belong to a king, the same reflection but a different self, an anarchy of sorts between outside and inside. This was indeed itself a hugely anarchic idea that Shakespeare was using at a time when everything was about the harmonious relationship between all parts of a human being, most particularly between mind and physiognomy. To be overtly in harmony and right proportion was to be fully in harmony and right proportion because costume and comportment, the externals, were at that time seen to be a complete articulation of what was on the inside. Courtiers, for example, strove for perfection on their outsides as an indication of their loyalty and duty. They began to carry little mirrors tucked into their waistbands or their caps and looked into these mirrors so often that Castiglione was, was forced to ask them not to do it because it seemed overly vain. But what they were trying to do was to line up their outsides with their insides to make duty something that went through and through. Like Richard II, Lear also uses the mirror. At the end of King Lear, the mirror is a test of whether Cordelia has breath. And it also offers us a deeper and more profound image of an old man, once so powerful, who doesn't have the power to bring his daughter back to life, nor does he have the power to arrest inevitable age or death. I want to apply this idea of the mirror Also to Gloucester, whom I've mentioned, is Lear's doppelganger or second self. At the place he thinks is Dover, Gloucester believes he's leaping to his death. He says, oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce. But he falls only to his knees. This fall is a mystery to him. And Edgar, his son, adds that it's a miracle. The miracle isn't in the fact that Gloucester survives the fall. How could he not when he falls only to his knees? But it's in what he comes to see within. In other words, Gloucester begins to perceive the mysteries of the mind, his mind, the very place he's possessed all of his long life, but is so very ignorant of. Ignorant of the workings of his mind, his family, his beliefs, Gloucester is, in effect, a stranger to himself. In embracing the miracle of his life, I believe that Gloucester also embraces its true mystery. And this mystery matches Lear's words late in the play when he's reunited with Cordelia about seeking to find in prison with Cordelia the mysteries of his life itself. He says, come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage 
when thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. And so we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies. And so we'll take upon us the mystery of things as if we were God's spies and we'll wear out in a walled prison pacts and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. That's such a beautiful speech. And it makes me think that perhaps the truth of life is not in the revelation of clarities, the stitching up of seams, the tying up of a neat bow of understanding. Perhaps the truth is in the capacity to take upon us the mystery of things, to embrace the most fundamental questions about essence, suffering, forgiveness, love, our very place in this universe. And I'd like to suggest that in giving up to the mysteries of life, giving himself fully to these mysteries, a once all-powerful king and his second self, Gloucester, move from sovereignty, that word I mentioned before, to self-sovereignty. Sovereignty is given to us by others. It is about the enormous privileges bestowed by power, status or wealth, being seen because we're believed to be important. But sovereignty can be taken away and we can be left bare and shivering on the heath or, in our world, homeless on University Avenue. Self-sovereignty, however, is ours alone to shape, to nurture, to cherish. The self-sovereignty of any one of us can be challenged, mocked or worse but far more ubiquitous, disregarded by the world. But this doesn't make self-sovereignty any less valuable. So let's hang on to our sovereignty, everybody. And for the holidays, let's also see the majesty in others. I'd like to close by giving special thanks to Cal Shakes for giving such joy to my life for the last 20 years and counting. I couldn't have been there without you to share in those, to borrow a word from Macbeth, multitudinous grove talks. I'd like to give a shout out to my mum in Australia. And I'd like to ask you to stay with us, to be with us in the new year. If you can afford to donate to CalShakes to keep this company thriving in 2023, looking through to our anniversary in 2024, that's wonderful. And if you can't afford it, we're happy, so happy, simply to have you. Thank you, everybody. Have a happy holiday and stay safe.